Bienvenidos al webinar Pay, Trabajos en Espacios Confinados. El webinar empezará en cinco minutos. Bienvenidos al Webinar Pay, Trabajos en Espacios Confinados. El webinar empezará en dos minutos.
Buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Liliana Cruz. Soy la directora para Latinoamérica del PEI y es un gusto para mí estar hoy con todos ustedes como moderadora de este webinar. Les doy la bienvenida al webinar Trabajos en Espacios Confinados, en el que tendremos a un experto, Art Sodermark, liderando durante la próxima hora este tema. Antes de que iniciemos, eh, les voy a dar algunos avisos importantes. El audio del webinar va a estar disponible en español y en inglés. En, y pues ustedes deciden en qué idioma desean escucharlo. La presentación que verán va a estar en español. Entonces, si quieren tener lo que ven y lo que escuchan en el mismo idioma, yo les sugiero que lo tengan en español y que lo escuchen en español el webinar completo. Para esto, ustedes pueden ir a la parte de abajo de sus pantallas y en el centro van a ver un mundo. Pueden escoger ese mundo y allí dan clic y van a ver varios canales. Uno de esos dice español. Por favor, escojan la opción de español y a partir de ese momento, cuando en el, se esté eh, hablando en inglés, ustedes escucharán absolutamente todo en español. También pueden escoger en, eh, como preferencia silenciar el audio original eh, y en ese caso, esa opción les va a servir si escuchan el audio original muy fuerte en, y no pueden escuchar bien la parte de español. Entonces, les sugiero también que tengan esa preferencia en cuenta. Art se concentrará en el tema por los próximos 45 minutos y después de esto vamos a tener un espacio para preguntas y respuestas. Si ustedes tienen preguntas a lo largo del webinar, por favor, en la parte también de abajo de sus pantallas van a encontrar una sección de preguntas y respuestas. Escriban sus respuestas allí que yo estaré haciendo eh, una recolección de todas las preguntas para que trabajemos eso al final de la, eh, de, de la presentación. En el, bueno, habiendo dicho esto, quiero hablarles un poco de Art Sodermark. Art Sodermark es propietario y director de capacitación de Platinum Engineering and Safety Inc., con más de 30 años de experiencia en la industria de la construcción y el petróleo. Cuenta con un enfoque práctico en su mensaje alrededor del tema de seguridad que combina lo académico, el cumplimiento normativo y el aspecto operativo. Cuenta con varias certificaciones de capacitación que incluyen instructor ambiental certificado, instructor certificado de la Administración de Salud y Seguridad Minera del Departamento de Trabajo de los Estados Unidos, MSHA, y es instructor certificado por el American Safety and Health Institute. Tiene una licenciatura también en Ciencias en Ingeniería de Seguridad y una maestría en Ingeniería Ambiental. Art es miembro de la Sociedad Estadounidense de Ingenieros de Seguridad, ASSE, y del Petroleum Equipment Institute, PEI, que trae a ustedes este webinar el día de hoy. Asociación en la que actualmente Art es consultor del Comité de Seguridad. Entonces, habiendo dicho esto, pues voy a darle paso a Art. And uh, with that, uh, I will pass it to Art. So Art, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for that introduction, Liliana. Let's get started uh, and talk a little bit about why we're here. Uh, it seems obvious we're here to talk about permit required confined space, but uh, more so why. Uh, it's a hazardous operation. Um, anytime we deal with confined spaces and the hazards within confined spaces, we have to consider uh, the risks associated with doing it. Uh, how will it affect me? How will it affect uh, work? How will it affect uh, relationships with uh, uh, customers or property damage, things like that? So that will be the context of our conversation today. And um, although somewhat brief, hopefully we'll cover the necessary uh, basics uh, to build on from there. So let's talk a little bit about where confined space definition comes from. So we know there are three things essentially that define a confined space. It's got to be big enough to work in. So, uh, and you have to be able to get in it. So it's a large enough for workers to enter and perform tasks, uh, it, it is difficult to get in and out of. So limited means of entry or exit. So we're crawling in, we're going through a hatch, a manway, something like that. Uh, and the third part is it's not designed for us to be in there. 
uh, it doesn't have ventilation or lighting or climate control or any of those things. Uh, there are a lot of examples of confined spaces. So uh, some of them listed on the screen, you know, tanks, vessel silos, bins, vaults. Uh, some of these on the list, we're going to relate specifically to uh, petroleum industry that we're in, uh, such as sumps and tanks. Um, and then other things to keep in mind if you ever get into other work where maybe there is an electrical vault or uh, a drainage manhole or that sort of uh, structure that you might have to enter. So keep this confined space definition in mind in case it does relate to other work that you might be doing. So uh, let's move on and talk about hazards in general related to confined space. Number one is the opportunity to have oxygen deficiency. Normal oxygen concentration in the air that we breathe should be somewhere around 21%, 20.8, 20.9%, somewhere in that range. Uh, we have an acceptable range for oxygen between 19.5 and 23.5. Um, certainly a significant hazard in the spaces that we're speaking of. In addition to that, we have the presence of combustible gases, um, generally speaking, methane, hydrogen, acetylene. Uh, for our world, of course, we're going to talk about gasoline vapors, the presence of gasoline vapors. Moving on from there, toxics. Uh, presence of toxic substances, again, uh, vapors associated with uh, fuels, any type of fuel are toxic to humans. Um, then, of course, we'll round out the conversation with physical hazards, uh, some listed, some not. Live electricity is definitely a, an issue. Um, we talk about mechanical hazards, maybe not so much in the context of this conversation, but generally speaking, we throw mechanical hazards in there. And then some other physical hazards usually hit the list. Uh, the opportunity to fall, the opportunity to be trapped, things like that. Uh, so generally speaking, that's where we stand. We have the basic definition of confined space. Limited means of entry or exit uh, is large enough to perform work and is not designed for continuous human occupancy. And then we have these lists of general hazards, oxygen deficiency, combustibles, toxics, and then some other physical hazard. Let's get a little more specific. When we get into the conversation about regulations associated with confined space, those regulations are entitled permit required confined space. So there is more to the more to it than just the general definition. So permit required confined spaces have or have the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. Uh, it's number one on the list. It's number one on the list for a reason. It is a significant hazard. Uh, we'll talk more about it as we go. Uh, moving down the list, uh, another definition of permit required. Material inside that could engulf the entrant. There are a list of things that fall, uh, on, a list of materials that fall into this category. Uh, water, of course, uh, grain, sand, things like that. Uh, if we're looking at how this relates to us in the petroleum world, not likely uh, a product that we're going to, uh, or, or a material that we're going to deal with that, that fits into this category. Third, a space that has an internal configuration that the entrant could become trapped or asphyxiated. So generally dealing with inwardly converging walls or slopes, um, sometimes we have spaces that have pipe penetrations, things like that, multiple story confined spaces, uh, multiple levels. Again, not generally something that falls into the petroleum category. Uh, there is a possibility when we're dealing with tanks, larger tanks or vessels, uh, or per perhaps uh, deeper than what would be considered average containment sums. Uh, uh, last thing on the list, any other recognized serious safety and health hazard. There's a list of things that fall into this category. Uh, depth, heat, um, and a lot of physical hazards. So uh, 
electricity being one of them or contact with live electricity being one of them. Uh, so we look at these four things, kind of recap a little bit. A permit required confined space has or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. That's number one, potential for engulfment, means where the entrant could become trapped or asphyxiated or any other recognized safety and health hazard. So uh, going forward, we're gonna shorten that and we're gonna refer to these as, as a permit space. Uh, we use that for, for our conversation. Now, as far as specifics to petroleum, petroleum retail, uh, commercial distribution of fuel, however you wanna describe it, we know we're talking about tanks whether they be underground tanks or above ground. Uh, and we're also talking about the collection of containment devices that we use, whether they're for uh, submerged pumps, uh, under dispenser containments, uh, or sometimes we're using transition sumps or piping setup. Any one of these gonna fall in the definition of a permit required space. So. If we think about that, recap the definition, has or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. We know that fuel vapors have the opportunity to produce a hazardous atmosphere. Uh, they also have the opportunity to uh, deplete oxygen. Uh, that being said, any one of these devices on this list, containment stump or a tank, has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. So therefore, it's a permit space all the time and some steps need to be taken in order to make it safe for entry. So we'll, we'll talk about what those steps are as we go along. So we talked generally about the hazards already. Uh, generally, the general hazards associated with confined space. Let's get a little more specific about uh, the hazards on the, uh, in the petroleum distribution side. Um, like I said, we know we're gonna have oxygen deficiency. Um, particularly if we're talking about uh, uh, the more volatile fuels, gasoline, of course, uh, being top of that list. Gasoline starts out as a liquid. We know it really wants to be a vapor. Uh, it readily volatilizes into a vapor. It is significantly heavier than air, uh, three to four times heavier than air to be exact. Uh, so as it's creating a vapor, it's pushing out any breathable oxygen from that space, uh, making it obviously difficult for us to survive or to work in. So we know oxygen deficiency is the top uh, hazard associated with petroleum spaces. Of course, we can't discount uh, or ignore flammables. As these fuels are dissipating, uh, they're going to create a flammable or explosive atmosphere. Um, I don't generally talk too much about the opportunity for, for spaces to explode uh, because typically it is a fire that happens, but a fire in a contained space can, can create an explosion or, 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 or at least mimic uh, an explosion and cause uh, a good amount of destruction. Uh, we know that fuels readily available to produce flammable concentration. Uh, uh, the third thing on the list, toxic. Uh, all fuel vapors are toxic to humans. Uh, they're toxic from an inhalation standpoint, from a contact standpoint. Uh, we shouldn't get it on our skin. We shouldn't be breathing the vapors associated with, with fuels. Uh, and we know as we're working in these confined spaces, uh, uh, they're definitely there. Uh, there is some good news uh, associated with this. The oxygen deficiency, the flammable atmosphere, and the presence of toxics are all coming from the same source. We remove one source, we remove all three hazards, uh, which is very good news for us. Um, so we'll, again, we'll more about that as we go along. One last thing to mention relative to these hazards is the concept of immediately dangerous to life and health. Um, Immediately dangerous comes up when we talk about permit spaces uh, and these hazards are present in concentrations that could lead to serious injury or death in a very short period of time. Uh, 
generally immediately dangerous to life and health issues, uh, exposure periods not exceeding 30 minutes or up to 30 minutes. So hence the, the terminology immediately dangerous to life and health. Uh, it is in fact uh, something that would happen rapidly, therefore something that we have to pay significant attention to. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, you know, some more terminology. Before we go too much further, we really should define what entry means. Uh, the rules are very clear on what entry means. And it, any part of the body passes into the space you have entered. Um, and they're very restrictive in that for a reason. Um, in all the conversations that I've had about confined space over the years, this comes up quite a bit. What constitutes entry? What define entry for me? Well, it's, it's very clear. Any part of the body passes through the opening, you have made entry. Um, and because of that, there's a desire on many entrance part to not pay attention to this definition. And the reason they don't wanna pay attention to it is because, well, uh, what happens if I just stick my hand in there? What happens if I just, um, I can stand, uh, I can put my feet in, but I can still stand up. Um, all of these opportunities to work around the definition only introduce people to hazards. So they're very restrictive with the definition. Therefore, we have to understand that we have to be very restrictive with how we control access to that space. Um, one of the other things that happens quite a bit or comes up relative to the entry conversation, uh, there are many spaces in the petroleum distribution world where the space isn't really big enough to enter but it still needs to be accessed to work in. So we might lay on the ground and reach in and do the work that way. Or if we're working on dispensing equipment, we'll lay on the ground and reach in. Uh, we're exposing ourselves to the hazards when we do that. And um, we're not really bodily entering the space. Well, it doesn't matter. We're still exposing ourselves to the hazards and some control over those hazards needs to be exercised or someone could end up seriously injured or killed or we could have a fire explosion etc uh, so again that's why the uh, the definition of entry is very specific and um, restrictive for that reason all right personnel to do an entry obviously you need an entry um, pretty straightforward the entrant is the person that is going to go into the space and do the work and they they have duties and responsibilities. Um, a couple things are more important. Obviously, they, they need to understand the work that they're going to do. They need to understand that the space is safe to enter. Uh, it's ventilated. It's isolated. Um, there are uh, any risks that they would have been taking um, have been controlled in some fashion. They also need to know that the instructions that they are given from the attendant are, uh, they need to be followed. And uh, regardless of the reason, if the attendant needs you to exit, you, you do so. Follow the rules associated with the entry. Don't take any unnecessary risk. Uh, so pretty straightforward when it comes to the duties of the entry. Now, next important person involved is the attendant. Most confined space entries, we're gonna have an attendant controlling access to the space, guarding entry to the space, um, making sure we don't have unauthorized entry, whether it be tools or equipment personnel. Uh, we also require the attendant to pay attention to um, we're maintaining conditions and we're making sure we don't end up with any unusual conditions. They're also there if a rescue is required, they will coordinate or summon rescue team, a uh, pretty important part of the operation. Um, <clears throat> So many times when confined space, confined space entry work is performed, uh, at least what I've seen in my experience, we will send an entrant in who is experienced, someone who obviously is qualified to do the work. We tend to take 
someone less experienced and make the attendant, give them the attendant responsibilities. Um, be careful when you do that, if you do that. Uh, attendance job, very important. They are monitoring the space, making sure that the people that are inside are, are still working in acceptable conditions. So make sure that your attendant is qualified to do the job. Entry supervisor. Uh, now, this entry supervisor is important. They are the ones, they are the person that's coordinating the entry. They are affirming that everything is, is acceptable to work inside. Now, they can also share responsibilities. Uh, the entry supervisor and the attendant could be the same person. The entrant and the entry supervisor could be the same person. But what we're saying here is when we're doing a confined space entry, an entry supervisor essentially certifies the entry. So it's probably going to be a team leader or a foreman or, or, or someone with, with that level of, of knowledge, expertise uh, to, to make those determinations. Uh, they're also going to coordinate rescue as well. So um, it makes sense. Uh, the idea of having a supervisor for a critical operation makes sense. So that's basically what, what we're saying. Now, as far as procedure goes, the procedure for entering a space may vary somewhat, but overall, it's going to be the same. We know we're gonna isolate the space first to make sure we don't have uh, hazards entering the space while we're working. We're going to ventilate because more often than not, we're going to have atmospheric hazards as our predominant issue. Uh, keep briefing. Uh, we're going to do an entry permit because this is permit space entry requires a permit. We're going to monitor the atmosphere in the space. And then, of course, uh, hopefully all things line up and we're going to perform the entry. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these as we go here, isolating the space. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, petroleum side of things, we're essentially pumping tanks, um, uh, removing fuel from containment devices. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're de-energizing electro equipment, perhaps performing lockout tag out. Uh, if we have the opportunity to remove any residues, fuels, sludge, anything that's creating a source inside the space from outside the space, then of course that would make sense as well. Any opportunity to limit the hazards within that space uh, prior to making entry makes sense. It's going to make ventilation easier. Uh, it's going to make entry safer. So isolating, removing the hazards, step one. Ventilating. Uh, as I mentioned already, Hazards associated with these spaces, oxygen deficiency, presence of flammables, presence of toxics, they all come from the same place. Therefore, we can eliminate them all at the same time. Ventilation is our best choice for that. Uh, I can't really um, emphasize enough how important ventilation can be. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, of all of the components for safe permit space entry, ventilation is top of the list. It is the most important part of the process uh, for a variety of reasons. One is it provides breathable air. It's removing flammable so we don't have fire explosion. And it's uh, eliminating or at least reducing the toxic concentration so we don't have exposure to workers that are in the space. Um, so pretty, pretty key, uh, <clears throat> variety of ways, couple of thumb rules to keep in mind. Um, there's large quantity of ventilation devices. We have to be a little bit careful with what we choose. Uh, I'll show you a couple examples here in a second, but, um, we have to be careful with what we use in that 
we are ventilating a, a, a potentially flammable or explosive environment. So intrinsically safe explosion proof devices are, are part of that conversation. Um, air operated, uh, also part of that conversation. Thumb rule for ventilation basically says we should replace four space volumes prior to entry or four space volumes an hour. Uh, most of the spaces, petroleum world, at least those that I've dealt with, are small enough where four space volumes an hour is generally not a problem. Um, but it is a guide. We also need to think about whether or not our ventilation is capable of keeping that, that space safe for entry while we're working in it. Um, rendering it safe for entry ahead of time is point number one. Point number two is maintaining it safe while we're in it, whether we're breaking into the gasoline system, maybe introducing fuel in space while we're working, um, all things that have to be considered. Last thing it mentions here is uh, making sure that our, our air source is not contaminated. So uh, depending on the location that you're working, we just have to be careful that we're not introducing a contaminant to the space while we're attempting to ventilate it. So a couple examples. Uh, this um, blower on the left, that's a, a, a typical Allegro confined space entry blower. Uh, it's eight inch. This one happens to be explosion proof. They come in explosion proof or non-explosion proof uh, versions. Uh, lengths of trunk 15 to 25 feet. Um, pretty flexible on, on uh, their application. They generally put out anywhere from 500 to 800 cubic feet per minute. So as far as effectiveness in uh, replacing four space volumes, they're, they're highly effective in doing that. Uh, the other device is a, as an air horn, um, more of a positive flow device. Uh, the Allegro blower on the left would be considered um, high volume, low pressure. Uh, the air horn requires an air compressor, so it works under the concept of a Venturi. So you hook high pressure air to it, it runs across the Venturi, creates a low pressure at the airflow end of the horn and uh, ventilates in that fashion. So it's a little more... Uh, a little more involved, requires an air compressor, uh, very positive means of ventilation. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, you would generally, at least in my experience, um, sumps, vessels, that sort of thing, more likely to use the blower pictured on the left. Tanks, more likely to use the, the venturi or the air horn pictured on the right. Uh, both very effective means of, of ventilation. All right. So <clears throat> we talked about ventilation early on in the conversation. So it makes it, it should emphasize the fact that it's important. So we isolated the space, we ventilated. Now we're gonna take the time to talk about the hazards in the space. We already know that the atmospheric hazards are significant enough, so we're gonna ventilate. And that's generally gonna be the case. So just make sure when you do a briefing, everybody is there. Um, Everybody understands their responsibilities. Everybody understands the hazards of the space. Um, if you want to use a hazard assessment device, uh, a checklist, uh, the entry permit itself, uh, something to document the hazards that you're going to encounter, so you have the opportunity to discuss them as a group, that makes sense. Uh, make sure that you have the necessary protective equipment. Um, suits, gloves, boots, whether it's to control some of the physical hazards or perhaps uh, even chemical hazards uh, for contact with gasoline fuels or uh, the byproducts associated with it. Another thing you wanna make sure happens during your briefing is that if you have to provide rescue, if the space is configured such that rescue is necessary or non-entry rescue is necessary, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, make sure that that's coordinated ahead of time prior to anybody going in the space. So uh, here's just a happy group getting ready or finishing their breathing. 
obviously they're uh, very well coordinated. They've got gear on uh, to uh, get the work done. Okay, entry. I'll show you an example of an entry permit in a second. And uh, there's no rule that says this is what uh, the permit should have. There are certain sections of the permit that are required. Um, other things can be added. You can adapt the permit to the space that you're working. The permit essentially is your authorization that everything is acceptable for entry. Um, we've located the space. We indicate on the permit where we're working, what we're doing. We have a spot on the permit to indicate our air monitoring results, making sure uh, or to document whether we have acceptable entry conditions. Some permits have personnel entering or authorized to enter and the times they go in and go out. Uh, some permits even have equipment documentation going in or going out. That's up to you. Um, permits are generally good for one shift, whatever that shift period is. Don't generally like to see them go over 12 hours. Uh, conditions can change over that period of time. And they, uh, the suggestion is to reassess your entry conditions um, to make sure nothing has changed that would affect anyone who's actually in the space. Um, we cancel permits when we're done and we put them in, in a file. We hold on to them just uh, for no other reason than to review at some point later. It's an audit point. Uh, for your confined space entry program, um, but uh, that's where we are with the permit. Here's an example of a permit. Uh, it's a little difficult to see, but uh, so this would essentially be a, a, a nine by 12, eight and a half by 11 uh, piece of paper. And um, as I mentioned, it has uh, location at the top, uh, description of the space. Uh, in many cases, the permit will be used as uh, a tool for rescue personnel to find you. If you're using um, a rescue team that isn't located on the, on the site, uh, and somebody, uh, if you had a problem, someone else identified that you had a problem, was attempting to help you, they could look at this permit and provide information to a rescue team to get to you to help you. So that is essentially the reason we're doing this permit and posting it. So rescue can find you if you need help. So keep that in mind when you're creating these permits, what the purpose is and why it's posted. Uh, moving on, there's an opportunity, like I said, in the center for you to write your air monitoring device. Uh, we know in uh, the petroleum distribution world, atmospheric hazards are a problem. Oxygen deficiency is a problem. We have to have an air monitoring device to make sure that our ventilation is effective and that we have achieved what are called acceptable entry conditions. And uh, those acceptable entry conditions are listed there. Oxygen in the normal range, as we discussed earlier. Occasionally, you might measure carbon monoxide. Uh, if you have equipment running, that sort of thing, surely the presence of flammables and the limit for flammables is set at uh, 10%. So we want less than 10% of our lower explosive limit on our meter. Those would be our acceptable entry conditions. Uh, there's also a spot on this permit if you uh, want to log results more frequently. Uh, the guide is once per hour. Uh, you could do it once every 15 minutes. You could do it uh, whatever makes sense relative to the hazards in the space, at least once an hour. Uh, again, an opportunity for authorized personnel to be added in or out. And then uh, at the bottom, we mentioned the duties and responsibilities earlier. And uh, one of which is the responsibilities of the entry supervisor. That person authorizes the entry by signature. And that person also cancels the entry by signature when the work is complete. All right. So we're going to test the atmosphere. This is where our combustible gas meter comes in. We talked about oxygen content in the presence of combustibles. 
And sometimes we're going to measure for the presence of toxic gases. Um, a couple examples here. Uh, this happens to be an industrial scientific brand Ventus MX4 four gas meter. It measures oxygen concentration, explosive uh, presence of flammables in lower explosive limit, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon monoxide. Uh, there's a variety of manufacturers, some better than others, uh, but this is an example of one that you can uh, incorporate into the air monitoring phase of the process. Uh, so once we've done those things, um, we've isolated, we ventilated, we did a safety briefing, um, we decided whether we needed rescue or not, uh, we are monitoring the space with a meter, creating acceptable entry conditions, and now we can go ahead and post our attendant, entrant, uh, and go ahead and do the work, right? Which is the which is the goal in the first place. Now let's talk a little bit about rescue. Uh, when confined space work is done, you have to be prepared to rescue in the event something doesn't work out as prescribed. Self rescue is the best choice. Uh, we want entrants to be aware of what's going on. They know if they've been exposed to a toxic substance. They know if their monitoring equipment is alarming, it's time to exit. And they also listen to the commands of their attendant, time to exit the space. That's the best, best choice. Um, now, if that's not possible, uh, if we have spaces that are deep, greater than five feet vertical in many cases, uh, we want to do non-entry rescue. That is safer for the rescue team. So we will have a rescue team available uh, they are stationed outside of the space when the work is going on. Uh, they're trained in advance of this work, so they know how to perform a rescue. They've practiced a rescue. And um, we're either going to use a tripod, winch, lifeline, something along those lines to facilitate the rescue. And uh, what we have here in this picture uh, of a horizontal rescue on the left, um, Situations like that, you might just use a lifeline where you're physically dragging someone out. Uh, there are devices that will allow for horizontal rescue that are mechanical. A uh, picture on the right is a work crew setting up a, a tripod and winch to, to do a vertical rescue. Uh, generally, vertical rescue greater than five feet vertical is when we're going to use a winch and tripod or that setup. Entry rescue, most hazardous. Um, generally, Entry rescue is going to be done by a professional, uh, fire crew, uh, some work sites have professional rescue teams available for that. Uh, it's generally not something that uh, uh, we as, as a work crew would, would want to do. Uh, Self-rescue is best, non-entry rescue second choice. If we have to make entry rescue, we want professionals to do that. So really not going to put a whole lot more emphasis on it than that. A uh, couple things to keep in mind. Uh, confined space work, as I mentioned at the beginning, can be particularly deadly. Uh, we know we have substances that remove uh, breathable air. We know we have the presence of flammable vapors, uh, toxics. Uh, in many cases, we have exposure to treat considered when we do this work. Um, one of the things that we have to think about is, yes, there is the possibility that people get injured in permit spaces. There's no question about that. But we also have to think about the fact that it is serious enough, the consequences are serious enough where we're into the serious injury or death category. So um, I, don't want to, I don't want to stress that too much, but uh, we do need to understand that that is the case. So I am going to show you something here. I uh, probably should preface this a little bit. It's, uh, it's not for everyone. Uh, but what you'll see in the center of the screen uh, is a confined space at a petroleum distribution facility. And uh, it doesn't go, uh, doesn't go as planned. So let me get this going for you. And here we go. So obviously the outcome here was 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 significant. So appeared to have someone working in a containment sump. 
uh, uh, something happened. Uh, there appears to be a, a cord. Maybe they were using an intrinsically safe device. It's hard to say. I don't know vapors and possibly ignited vapors in the tank that led to that explosion. And um, obviously the result to our worker. Um, surely situations that we need to avoid. <clears throat> All right. So a couple things, uh, somewhat in closing, there is a lot of information regarding confined space work, uh, quite detailed information as a matter of fact. So as far as our work in the US is concerned, we have the Occupational Safety and Health Administration that has two major documents uh, 29 CFR 1910.146 is permit required entry in what uh, what is considered general industry. And then we have 29 CFR 1926 subpart AA, permit required entry in construction and maintenance. Uh, both very useful documents, um, detailed in how the work is to be performed, uh, steps necessary for you to build a confined space entry program and actually do the work. Uh, and with that, uh, that's what I have. Art, uh, thank you so much. Uh, a lot of interesting information that uh, we need to have in mind at the moment of working in confined spaces. And uh, para todos, eh, tengan presente que las últimas normas eh, que mencionaba Art Toda la socia están disponibles también en español en y ustedes las pueden consultar fácilmente en la página eh, de ellos. Ahora, como recordatorio para todos, ART uh, también estará presentando este tema durante la convención del PEI en Chicago en octubre. ART también es miembro del PEI y su información de contacto está disponible en el directorio del PEI. Entonces, ustedes pueden buscar su compañía, Platinum Engineering and Safety, y allí pueden comunicarse con ART directamente para obtener más información sobre cómo ayudar a sus empresas con sus programas de espacios confinados. Entonces, pues, vámonos a la parte de preguntas. Hemos recibido eh, preguntas muy interesantes. En, eh, voy, a, eh, bo, voy a empezar entonces con Art a, a, a correr las preguntas que hemos tenido acá, tratando de compilarlas de la mejor manera posible. So, Art, uh, we have several questions to get to. So, I, I will start with this one that I saw here. Uh, so, someone from Mexico. Uh, is asking that uh, you mentioned the use of lifelines in the non-entry rescue. Should the lifelines to be used in all cases when you are working in a confined space? And the, per the, the reason because the person is mentioning that is because he saw some war workers going to the tank using a ladder, but uh, without a lifeline. Uh, it's always a good idea to use a lifeline. Uh, there will be times when the equipment that we decide to use during an entry makes it more difficult to perform the entry. So we have to be careful with that. Uh, risk assessment ahead of time says what makes sense uh, for the work being performed. And many times, uh, For example, a lifeline associated with a ladder entry likely doesn't make sense because you wouldn't be able to lift somebody up with a rope uh, who entered a space with a ladder. So in a case like that, you would likely want to use some sort of a retrieval device to remove people from that vertical space. Uh, lifelines in general make sense. Uh, more so for same level or horizontal entry than they do vertical entry. Okay. Hopefully that answers the question. I think it does. Now, uh, I have another one here that it looks simple, but I don't think it's simple at all. Uh, the, because uh, uh, when you are working in confined space, uh, you, you cannot define always what means a confined space. So the question is, uh, in which dimensions 
you consider a confined space when a space is a confined space yeah there's there are, there are no dimensions associated with confined space none whatsoever uh it, it's it's interesting that this question came up because this has been a question uh <laughs> as far as confined space is concerned the in, the entire time i've been involved with confined space uh people want to know when whether there's a depth requirement or a width or a volume nothing there are no sizes associated with confined space it's all related to the hazards so we have to go back to the definition hazard has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere potential for engulfment entrapment or any other recognized safety and health hazard if you check off one of those or multiple it is a permit space and you have to take action it has nothing to do with size all right perfect now, um, I think you mentioned something uh, during the presentation about this, but uh, uh, anyway, I think it's important to mention this. Is, is there a maximum time to stay in a confined space for reasons of safety or atmospheric conditions or any other kind of conditions? Uh, no, uh, there is nothing in the regulation that mentions time. Uh, we have to decide based on our risk assessment whether there needs to be uh, a limit on time. Uh, usually, uh, the only time I've ever been restricted on time in an entry is due to heat. Uh, and that was determined during our safety briefing prior to making entry. We decided that we were gonna work 30 minutes inside and then we were going to come out and then someone else would go in for 30 minutes and we would take turns that way because of the heat. You might do the same thing with exposure to toxics. Uh, you might do something similar based on uh, your atmospheric conditions changing while you're working. Um, but you make that determination yourself. There's nothing within the regulation that, that guides you other than you do your safety briefing, you do your assessment, decide how to enter the space. That is interesting how you back to the previous answer about that, uh, the criteria that you have at the moment that you enter in confined spaces is key. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about regulation. And I see a question here about uh, the United States regulation. So what United States regulations cover permit space entry? Right. So... Uh... Simplest thing to do if you want to review those is go to OSHA, OSHA.gov, the federal OSHA website. And the, the slide that's I'm, that I'm sharing right now that's up on the screen mentions two different regulations. Uh, both are very similar. Uh, in the US, we have two basic types of uh, employer. One is a general industry employer, one is a construction company. Uh, there's two different permit required rules for each type of business. They're very similar. Uh, as far as work in the US is concerned, I tend to follow the construction rule more so than mm -hmm. the general industry rule because it does allow some exceptions for work. Uh, meaning fewer fewer workers. There's 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 options within it that uh, work better within the petroleum distribution world um, than the general industry standard. But both are very effective. Uh, they're very detailed and very um, applicable to the work, uh, whichever one you decide. Okay, great. Now you talk about the responsibilities of the entrant, uh, the attendant, uh, the supervisor, and you mentioned that it's responsibility of the attendant to monitor at atmospheric conditions in the space prior and during entry. So the question here is, should the entrant to have a device all the time with him to monitor atmospheric conditions? Mm. Uh, perhaps. Uh, it is the attendant's responsibility uh, 
and I don't think you can, you can, you would put that on somebody else. That is the attendance role. Uh, now, do you also, does it, would it be a best practice to have the entrance being monitored directly? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, in my experience, I've done both. Uh, there have been many times I've entered a space where I've had a personal monitor clipped to my shirt. Uh, there have been many other times where the attendant was, was uh, relaying information to me or, or, or giving me readouts as to what was going on inside. Um, more often than not, I was reliant on the attendant and I didn't have a personal monitor because the personal monitor would either be damaged or, or, or there was a risk that I was, that was going to be in the way. Uh, so I let the attendant do it. They could pay full attention to that meter. I could pay full attention to the work. Um, either way, uh, sometimes spaces are too big and you want the entrant to have a personal monitor. Mm -hmm. um, so there's nothing within the rule that says you have to do it one way or the other. It says you need to continuously monitor whenever practical, attendant, entrant, both, you get to decide. Okay, great. And uh, now that we are talking about devices, so I see here a question about other kind of devices, that is uh, the devices that you can use to communicate with uh, the people that is outside of the confined space. So the question is what types of devices uh, to communicate with the people that is outside can be used within a confined space with the presence of uh, fuel vapors? Uh, that's a really tough answer. Uh, there aren't very many devices that are acceptable for that application. Uh, my experience, we've done mostly verbal uh, voice commands. Um, I stay within reasonable distance where I can hear voice commands by the attendant. That's how we communicate. Um, because the, the types of devices or to have an intrinsically safe explosion proof radio or communication system, uh, one, they're, they're, they're difficult to find and two, they're expensive. Uh, so most companies don't use them for that reason or for those reasons. So you're left with verbal communication. Uh, there have been times where we came up with other communication systems. For example, uh, pulling the lifeline. Uh, if, if my attendant would pull the lifeline once, I would pull it once in return and that meant we were okay. If he pulled it twice, it was time for me to exit. If I didn't reply with two rope tugs, he would pull me out on, a, on, on, on his own, uh, things like that. So uh, never, I personally have not been in a situation where we had to get uh, really expensive or hard to come by communication devices. We, we generally relied on verbal or some uh, very basic means of communicating. Okay, so basically it's key to not relay only into communication devices and to use your own body to, to do these kind of things. Interesting. I, I, not I, guess it is, I, well, I guess it is fair to say one thing I should add. Uh, don't use a typical radio, uh, two-way radio or, or, or walkie-talkie or walkie -talkie? A, a cell phone. Yeah, don't, don't use that those devices because they are not acceptable for use and could lead to a fire explosion. Good. Um, let's talk a little more about devices because I, I, I see here many questions about devices. So okay. uh, one of the questions that I see here is how often most of the devices that measure atmospheric conditions of confined spaces be, should be calibrated? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, the companies that manufacture these, these devices, they decide what the range should be. Uh, for example, the device that I showed in the presentation, 
uh, industrial scientific, their devices can be set to be calibrated daily all the way up to once a year and anywhere in between. Uh, so depending on how the device is used determines how often it should be calibrated. Now, once a day, if you're using a device a lot, makes sense. Once a year probably doesn't. A lot of things can happen to a device in a year's time. Uh, most companies or most users will find somewhere in between, maybe once a month, uh, maybe once a week. Uh, what I like, uh, and this was something that was never available to us with uh, equipment in the past. Modern equipment can be field calibrated by the user every time you use it. And I am a fan of doing that. That's the advice from me. If you're going to get a meter, buy one that can be field calibrated, calibrate it yourself. Uh, they're relatively simple. Yes, you have to go through a little bit of training and uh, develop a proficiency in calibrating it. But once you've done that, you can have a calibrated device available every time you use it. Okay, okay, thank you, Art. Um, so we have four more minutes and uh, so I'm sure I'm, we will not be able to cover all the questions. So let's talk a little bit about rescue. I have a question here about, do we need to provide rescue personnel? And if so, do they have to be specifically trained? Uh, yes. Uh, if we're doing confined space work, rescue needs to be provided. Uh, we either have to provide it ourselves or we have to have a rescue team available. Uh, whether that's a, a, a fire department, a third party, um, rescue needs to be available. Now, if we are providing our own rescue, uh, as I talked about in the presentation, non-entry rescue would be best. Um, but if entry is required, either non-entry or entry rescue needs to be practiced at least once a year. That is what the, the U.S. regulation tells us we need to do. So if I'm using a, uh, a tripod and a winch to perform vertical rescue, I have to perform a rescue annually in order to, be prof in order to prove that I'm proficient at doing it. I know how to use the equipment. I know when to use the equipment. Um, and the other part of that is if I'm, if I'm an entrant, I likely should be retrieved. I should know what it feels like in order to, I, know, I should know what it feels like to be pulled out of a space with these devices. So uh, as to be prepared for, for it when it does actually uh, need to happen. So okay. that's where the training comes in. Okay. And that, that now let's talk a little bit about certification. That, uh, so uh, what steps uh, are required to be certificate in permit space entry? Uh, depends on how you look at it. Uh, from, a, from an employer or from a company standpoint, uh, we should have a written confined space entry program, a written policy, which includes the permit that we spoke of in the presentation. So a written entry program, a written permit system. Uh, from there, we're going to uh, provide some training. So we're gonna go through that regulation and talk about the entry itself and how we perform these steps. Uh, you obviously have to purchase equipment and, and demonstrate proficiency with the equipment. Monitoring devices, meters, ventilation devices, and rescue equipment. Uh, and then, as we just mentioned, practice a rescue. Um, if you've done those things, then you can consider yourself, uh, if myself as a provider of training, I would consider that certified and, and permit required confined space entry. All right. All right, Art, thank you so much for all the knowledge that you have shared with, uh, with us today.
Eh, y para todos ustedes, eh, nuevamente les recuerdo que pueden contactar a Arte y se los recuerdo porque veo que eh, se nos quedaron muchas preguntas. Entonces pueden contactar a Art directamente, pueden buscarlo en el directorio del PEI, buscar la compañía de él en, y, y pues hablar con él alrededor de todos esos temas que hay preguntas. Antes de que nos vayamos, un par de cosas que les pueden interesar. La primera es que recuerden que del 5 al 8 de octubre tendremos la convención del PEI, que será en Chicago. La convención tendrá la feria más grande del sector, tendrá un programa en inglés y tendrá también un programa para Latinoamérica en español. Entonces, si desean registrarse, pueden ir a www.pei.org y allí pueden encontrar toda la información acerca de la convención en la sección de eventos. Eh, tengan en cuenta que hay precios más cómodos hasta el 24 de septiembre. Y la segunda cosa, quiero contarles que tendremos próximamente un webinar en español sobre control de flotas y automatización, que va a estar liderado por Pablo Waldi, que es CEO de un grupo empresarial eh, con operaciones en diferentes países de América Latina. Puede ser muy interesante eh, para todos ustedes. Este webinar estará abierto a miembros del PEI. Si desean más información, por favor, no duden en contactarme. Mi correo es lcruz.pei. Punto org. Y habiendo dicho eso, eh, pues les doy las gracias a todos eh, por asistir. A Art, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros el día de hoy y les deseo un muy buen día. Hasta luego.